Father, we ask you to meet with us now once again. We come before you, Lord God, as we open your word, praying, Lord God, that by your spirit you would speak to us, Lord God. We pray that the things we learn would never increase our knowledge with the mere aim of increasing our knowledge, but increase our knowledge with the aim of making us more like your son, more effective in serving him and helping others in his name, the name in which we pray, the one who saved us, Jesus. Amen. The ships of Tarshish. We're looking this morning at the ships of Tarshish. Turn with me, please, first of all, to the book of Psalms, the 48th Psalm. With the east wind, thou dost break the ships of Tarshish. God breaks them with the east wind. Now in the Septuagint, not the Hebrew but the Greek Old Testament, the word for an east wind or a northeasterner is a yorakilo. It is the same wind that destroyed Paul's ship in the book of Acts chapter 27. Same wind that destroyed Paul's ship in Acts 27. And remember, it's a picture of something spiritual. God will send this wind to destroy the ships of Tarshish. The ships of Tarshish create a problem. There are two, possibly three, places called Tarshish in Scripture. We know there was a nation Tarshish from the Table of Nations in Genesis chapter 10. One of the places called Tarshish, we don't know where it was, but it was somewhere on the east coast of Africa. Another was identified as the western extreme of the Mediterranean, probably the coast of Spain near Gibraltar, where Jonah tried to escape to, and there have been others who speculated it was an ancient biblical name for even Great Britain. No definite proof for that. Be that as it may, we know that every time the Bible speaks of Tarshish virtually, there's some kind of a warning. Some kind of a warning. It doesn't even seem to matter which Tarshish. Isaiah 23 tells us, Well, oh well, ships of Tarshish. Something bad for those ships. When Jonah was trying to get away from God, he was called to go to the eastern extreme of the known world, which was Nineveh. Instead, he went to the westernmost extreme of the known world, Tarshish. He went as far away from God and God's will and God's purpose as he could. He went in the diametric opposite position of where God called him to go. And of course, in Jaffa, he boarded a ship for Tarshish, but the ship sank. It never arrived. God had his calling on Jonah. God had a mission for Jonah. And he was not going to escape to Tarshish. There's always something bad with Tarshish, it would seem. Always something bad. Let's look, please, to the book of 2 Chronicles. Jehoshaphat was a good king. In fact, a very good king. But like most good men, he was not without his faults. Not without his weaknesses. And his repeated weakness was nepotism. And letting the nepotism, family ties, drag him into alliances and relationships with bad people. We once did a tape called The Chink in the Armor, where he rode in the chariot of Ahab and became confused with Ahab. And in the process of being confused with Ahab, he made himself a target. Some people ask me in America why I refuse to go on Christian primetime TV, or why I had to turn down my friend in this country, Howard Condor, when he offered me a series on the book of Daniel on Revelation TV. Well, the simple answer is, I don't want it to be Kenny from 8.30 to 9, Jacob from 9.30 to 10, and Benny from 10 to 10.30. I just don't want to be identified with those people. I don't want to ride an Ahab's chariot. I'll become a target. I'll be confused with them. 
Now, we did a tape on this. That we have the same God and all that stuff. I was in Hawaii in January, and I had it out with little Benny in Borders. He came with his muscle, his honcho, his bodyguard, and his, his sidekick. And he's in the States all the time. He's always on about how he was born in Israel, which he was, not from a Jewish background, from an Arab Catholic background of some kind. And how he knows... Hebrew, and how the Hebrew says this and the Hebrew says that in the original text. One time he said in the Exodus, the Hebrew says that the water turned to ice. That's how the Hebrews escaped. Now it says no such thing in the Hebrew text, but because Benny said it on television, people in America believed it, at least his people did. So he came into borders, and I just went up to him, and his bodyguard was freaking out, and I addressed him in Hebrew. And Excuse me? <laughs> you mean you really don't speak Hebrew? Not really. <laughs> I told him I've got a list of prophecies this long that you made in the name of the Lord. That didn't happen. They were time-specific prophecies. You made them. Read Deuteronomy 18. Read the Word of God. God says, you're a false prophet. You need to repent and get out of the ministry. He couldn't deal with it. We shouldn't be identified with people like that because the world sees them and the world thinks that that's what we all are. We have no testimony, no witness. So I don't get involved with them. The Lord wants me on the idiot box. He can put me on the idiot box without having to compromise. But I figure they probably have enough idiots on the idiot box anyway, so they don't need another one. But if the Lord saw open the door, I would do it at the expense of having to compromise with proven false prophets. This was the weakness of Jehoshaphat. He was not a bad man. He was a good king, and he did many, many good things. His father was essentially somebody who tried to be a good man. But he had this weakness. God answered his prayers. God used him to bring victories. God used him to do a lot of things. He was always trying to revive things. But things did not always work the way that he wanted. Let's look a little further. Verse 35 of Second Chronicles chapter 20. In fact, let's begin in verse 32. And he walked in the way of his father Asa, another good king, and did not depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. The people had not yet directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first to last, behold, they were written in the annals of Jehu, the sons of Hinani which is recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. We've warned many times about the high places. They did not begin worshipping Molech or Baal on the high places. They did not begin worshipping the demon gods of the Canaanites on the high places. They began worshipping Yahweh on the high places. But as again, as we've warned a number of times, the Hebrew term for unbiblical worship <coughs> and the Hebrew term for idolatry is the precise same term. The precise same term. God does not draw a distinction between unbiblical worship and worshiping other gods. You can worship the true God in an unbiblical way, and as far as God's concerned, it is unacceptable. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. The term Avodah Zerah. Literally, strange worship or alien worship. Remember when the sons of a certain leader burned the form of incense that was not ordained by God? They burned strange fire and God judged them. They were not burning it to another God. They were burning it to Yahweh. If you worship the true God in the wrong way today, 
you'll wind up in idolatry tomorrow. The Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, did not begin in necromancy and idolatry and superstition. They began by worshiping the true God in an unbiblical way. You shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. By virtue of the fact you bow down to a statue and say, Ave Maria, it is an act of idolatry. No matter what they say, the word of God calls it idolatry. You can even be worshiping before a statue of Jesus. It is burning strange fire. It is avodah zerah. To God, the whole thing is no good. Because it is only a matter of time before you will wind up in full-fledged idol worship. You're already on the wrong road. If I was to leave tonight, I have to head up towards Sheffield. If I was to get on the M1 and head south, I'm already heading in the wrong direction. I might not reach London, but even if I only reach Coventry, it's only a question of distance. I'm going the wrong way. I'm on the wrong road. I should be on the M1 north, not the M1 south. When I want to go home, I want to be on the M1 south. I don't want to be heading for Leeds. They're on the wrong road. Now look what he does here. He did not take it down because the people wanted it. Remember, when good leaders go off, they do not go off by doing something wrong. They go off by compromising, by failing to do something they should. They compromise on something. They tolerate something. The Word of God says that they should not. And he was no exception. But we're told why he did it. He was something of a populist. He was a good king and the people liked him, and he liked the fact that the people liked him. Now, nobody wants to be hated, but Jesus specifically warned, beware when all men speak well of you. This is how Billy Graham got in trouble, according to Dave Hunt. I don't know, but I know this. The high places were wrong. And it says, for the people had not yet directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. A good leader, a faithful leader, say a good pastor, he can prevent the people from going away from God. But he cannot cause the people to come to God. A good leader can prevent things from going off. He can keep things on track. A good leader can prevent the people from going off. He can prevent them from going away from the Lord. But a good pastor, the best preacher in the world, cannot make the people come to the Lord. Encourage it, be an example of it, all that, but he can't make it happen. He can stop things from going bad, but he can't make things as good as they can be. It's not in the final analysis down to the leader. A bad leader will assure a church will go off. A good leader will not assure things are going to be as they should. The rest of the acts he did, first to last, are written in the annals of Jehu, the son of Hinani, recorded in the book of Kings. And after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel. He acted wickedly in so doing. Ahaziah was the biological son of Ahab and Jezebel. He was literally the son of Jezebel. The Lord Jesus used Jezebel as an illustration of the spirit of false religion in the book of Revelation. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. He's the son of Jezebel. There are many kings who are sons of Jezebel. There are bishops who are sons of Jezebel. There are superintendents of denominations who are sons of Jezebel. There are pastors who are sons of Jezebel. The same as there are Jehoshaphats, there are Ahabs. There are sons of Asa, and there are sons of Jezebel. He makes a deal with the son of Jezebel. That was his weakness. He forged alliances with others who claimed to be Jewish, who claimed to have the same God, even though where their hearts were at, where their doctrine was at, and where their practice was at, was very different than what was written in Scripture. 
After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel. He acted wickedly in so doing. So he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Etzion Geber. Etzion Geber is the current location of Eilat, the Israeli port and resort on the Red Sea. It is the area of Eilat and the Jordanian port of Aqaba. Okay. Now here we have a complication. Again, which Tarshish? There was no Suez Canal in those days, so the Tarshish that Jonah would have tried to go to from Joppa would not have been navigable. As far as I know, nobody until Prince Henry, who was half English and half Portuguese, many centuries later, tried to sail around the Horn of Africa. It would be pretty dire prospect to say somebody in such ancient times could have done that, or even attempted to do it, or even known it was possible to do it. But there he is making these ships at Eilat, at Etzion Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodavahu of Marasha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. So the ships were broken and could not go to Tarshish. Just like it says in Psalm 48, the Lord destroys those ships. A good man gets involved with a bad one. He gets an ambition and a vision that's not of God, not from God. He pursues it in league with the backslider, with the son of Jezebel. He thinks he's going to achieve something but it doesn't happen. God warns him to others, and then the fleet is sunk. Now notice, the first thing he did wrong was he failed to do something he should have. He compromised on the high places. Secondly, he was a populist. He wanted the people to like him. Now, unlike myself, pastors are people people. I'm okay for evangelism. I'm okay with dealing with unsaved people. I can witness to unsaved people, okay. But when you want to get into pastoral relationships and things like that, it is not my gift, thank God. And I see what pastors are like. They're true shepherds. I may be a wolf shooter, but I can sh protect the sheep from wolves, but they do more than that. They feed the sheep, they take care of the sheep, and so forth. They're very loving people. And sometimes loving people can be like parents who don't correct their children when they should. We don't want to be overly strict. We don't want to be overly permissive. But the fact of the matter is every parent at times has been either overly strict or overly permissive. None of us have it right except God as Father. Well, he wants the people to like him, but he has another motive. What is it? What is this thing with Tarshish? We're told here in Chronicles that his annals are recorded in the book of Kings. Now, Chronicles is more the historical perspective how the reign of the monarch affected the nation. Kings is more biographical. When the Holy Spirit gives more than one account of something in the Bible, just like you have synoptic gospels, he does it for a reason. The more the Holy Spirit puts something in the Bible, the more important it is, and he gives us another account of this. Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings 22. Verse 41, now Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, became king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. 
His mother's name was Azuvah, the daughter of Shidhi. And he walked in the way of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from doing it. Right in the sight of the Lord, this was a good man. However, the high places were still not taken away, and the people sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. But Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. He joined the ministers fraternal. He joined churches together. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might which he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah, which we've already read? And the remnant of the Sodomites who remained in the days of his father Asa, he expelled from the land. He was not like an Anglican vicar who will remain part of a church that ordains homosexuals. He was not an Anglican. He was more like a Christian. He wouldn't put up with homosexual ordination. He stood up on this issue of homosexuality. He wasn't a Methodist. He wasn't a Presbyterian. He wasn't in the United Reformed Church, and he wasn't in the Church of England. He stood up on the issue of homosexuality. There's a crazy man in America named Brian McLaren, the Emergent Church, saying the church should give it a moratorium and not speak about it for five years. <laughs> Just, he said, before we pronounce a decree, well, in the book of Romans, God already pronounced a decree. The book of Deuteronomy, God already pronounced a decree. Why does God need man to pronounce a decree on something he's ruled on? But you're finding more and more people in this country following the emergent church. That's the next coming gimmick. Purpose-driven is the door to the per uh, emergent church. That's the next flavor of the month. And of course, he says there's no hell, and he says, you know, we can't say homosexuality is wrong. These are evangelicals, by the way. Just the next natural step. Well, this guy did. He stood up on the moral issue. Compromised on the high places, but when it was a clear moral issue, he stood up. Well, our pastor doesn't agree with homosexual ordination. But then it continues. It goes on. Now there was no king in Edom. A deputy was king. Edom, of course, is southern Jordan. Wherever you have a power vacuum, look out. Etzion Gabor was the port of Edom. Today it's called Aqaba. And it continues. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they did not go, for the ships were broken at Etzion Geber. Then Ahaziah the son of Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat was not willing. Notice how he was. He would never go all the way into something wrong. He'd never put two feet into it. He'd put one foot into it. Well, yes, I'll make an alliance with you, and we'll build these ships together, but your sailors can't come into my ships. <laughs> I'll get close to you, I'll unite with you, but only up to a certain point. I'll let there be high places, but you have to worship Yahweh in the high places. You can't worship Molech. Up to a certain point. But then it continues. Jehoshaphat was not willing. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Yoram became king in his place. And of course, once Yoram became king in his place, things quickly went downhill. Things very quickly went downhill. Had his father taken down the high places, it wouldn't have happened. It only takes one generation for a church to go off. One. One change of leadership for a church to go off. One change of leadership for a denomination to go off. One generation. That's all it takes. 
The history of the church is just like the book of Kings. One generation changes everything, either for good or for bad. It can either be a revival or a backsliding. But he didn't pave the way for the next generation the way he should have. This far, no further. Yes, I'll make an alliance with the son of Jezebel, but I won't compromise on the homosexual issue. Yes, I'll build ships with the son of Jezebel, but his sailors can't get in my ships. I'll let you have the high places with restrictions. This was not a bad guy. He was like a lot of people today, but what were his motives for making an alliance with the son of Jezebel? Just because he was someone who was a Hebrew and someone who claimed to have the same God. To understand this, we have to understand the empire had fragmented between the north and the south. What was joined under David and blossomed under Solomon fragmented with Rehoboam and Jeroboam in the aftermath of the sin of Solomon. They declined as a regional power, as an empire, they declined. And it was always their ambition to get back to the way it used to be. Their thinking was, for us to get back to the way it was when we blossomed under David and Solomon, we have to be united again. Well, there were those who said unity at any cost. But Jehoshaphat wouldn't go that far. He'd say unity only up to a certain point. We'll build the ships with you, but you can't get in them. Okay. Well, we'll participate in churches together, but we're not going to march in a procession to Mary. Right. We'll have the Toronto with restrictions. We'll have the gym challenge, but we're not going to raffle off any automobiles. We'll have the purpose driven, but we won't have Rick Warren's teaching. <laughs> they go so far. I know it's not all good. There's some good in it, that usual thing. They were driven by this ambition to try to get back to the way it used to be. And what happened was they built these ships to go to Tarshish because that's what Solomon did with the Queen of Sheba, Machisheva. And they bought all this gold and all this wealth. The ivory and the gold came from there. They thought that they would gain a financial windfall where he could finance the re-expansion of God's people. His motives were not bad. He wasn't trying to line his own pockets. I don't question his motives, but his methods. One compromise led to another. Got to get the gold. Now again, we have two accounts of this. We have the account of what happens with this gold in Chronicles and in Kings. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 9. Things are at their absolute apex. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with difficult questions, etc. And all this stuff began to happen. It says the same thing in Kings. We've got to get back there. Somehow there is this naive characteristic in the human condition which is denigrated 
by the book of Ecclesiastes. God makes fun of it. It's called longing for the good old days. The book of Ecclesiastes, God says, do not say the former days were better than these. It is not from wisdom that you speak this. And I've heard people saying of the generation before mine, I remember when I was young. Yeah, when people died of infectious diseases that can now be cured with something you can buy over the counter in a pharmacy, when only the privileged could get a university education, <laughs> where international travel was for the wealthy, unless you joined the merchant navy or the forces. The good old days. The good old days were never really that good. When we read the epistles, we see that the apostolic church had one problem after another. Things that would make your hair stand on end even by modern standards. The only thing there was was the apostles upholding biblical doctrine and withstanding the onslaught. But the problems were still there. Tremendously there. Good old days are never really that good. This is a mentality of the world to long for the way things used to be, to try to get back to... This is not God's worldview. <laughs> the worldview that God tries to engender in his people is never to look backward, always to look forward. When the Bible says the ancient paths, I mean, get back on the right road. But you go forward on it, not backward on it. <laughs> God's view, God's emphasis, his focus for his people is always to look forward never to look backward. Even when we remember the Lord's death and we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death until he comes. When we look back, it's always to learn from history. It's always to remember where we came from, to know where we're going. God's focus is always the future. It's never the past. It's man's focus. It's the past. This is not a biblical concept. It is a concept in the Far East. For instance, in Japan, Shintoism, they have such a nebulous view of the future, they look to the ancestors, they have to look to the past for some spiritual meaning. You see this in Africa with the ancestor worship. The view of the future, it's too nebulous in their culture. They look to the back, to the back. they look to the ancestors, they have to go, go to the dead. God says never look to the dead, look to the living. Don't look back to Solomon. Uh, Solomon blew it. Learn from his good points, learn from his bad points, but don't hearken to get back there. We're supposed to look forward to the coming of the kingdom of the Messiah. That should be our aim. I remember the good old days and when I was young. Ecclesiastes said this is foolish talk. It's foolish talk. And I've seen people talk like that in Pentecostal circles, the way the Assemblies of God used to be 25 years ago. Yeah, I know the way it was 25 years ago. But the fact is, 25 years ago, there were people who made mistakes in the Assemblies of God, the same as Jehoshaphat did. Good men who compromised on certain issues that they should not have, and the result is what you have now. The same as Joram followed Jehoshaphat. He longed for the good old days. Now let's see what happens in the days of Solomon when you get these ships of Tarshish. Let's look. The Queen of Sheba gives him all of this stuff. And they begin to sail boats together. She gave him 120 talents of gold in verse 9, great amounts of spices and precious stones. All this wealth. In verse 6, we read about his greatness, his splendor, his wisdom. But then it continues. Verse 13, now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. On the Antichrist tapes, we point out 
that two of the places where the number of beasts occurs most conspicuously is with backslidden Solomon. Wherever you see that number or its multiples. 18, 666, plays on three sixes. The Holy Spirit is showing us something about the Antichrist to come. And here it's of course associated with his wealth. And of course 666 will be, again, wealth. Purchasing. On St. Valentine's Day, I went into the Waitrose supermarket near where I live in Surrey at the moment. And it was the first day of that chip and pin thing. And they had a sign at the cashier and it said, no number, no purchase. No number, no purchase. What does that tell you? <laughs> well, one of these days it's going to be no number, no purpose. It's not going to be a chip and pin, it's going to be a chip. I got a thing called a porta pass somewhere. It's so I don't have to present a passport when I go into the USA. I don't have to stand in line. I don't have to do anything except have my porta pass. It is for expatriates who live outside of the states. It's for diplomats. It's for airline crews. It's for military personnel. It's for people like that who go back and forth all the time. And you don't have to go through the usual questions. There is one catch. You insert the card into a computer, and you put your hand on an infrared plate. You've got a number and a hand. Bing, that's him. Welcome home. <laughs> Welcome to the United States. You've got a number, and you've got a hand. How long is it going to be before somebody puts the number on the hand? Now, they say it's to make it easy for airline crews and diplomats and things like that, and expatriates. Well, that's true, but in fact, it is also an experiment. Because in the war against terror, they're afraid of how many passports are stolen, are easily counterfeited. People can get into Britain, to America, to Australia with counterfeit passports. They could be terrorists. Therefore, we need biometric means of identification. So, we got this number and this right hand. Who's the right <laughs> How long is it going to be before they try to do this? You see what's coming. One of the things that frightens me so much about a man like a deceiver like Rick Warren is that the Word of God tells us to beware of these things when we see them happening. The Word of God makes it clear that the book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible with a blessing on reading it. A specific blessing. There's a blessing on all of God's Word, of course. But the book of Revelation is the only book with a specific blessing on reading it. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. Yet Rick Warren says, Keep away from biblical prophecy and end times prophecy. It's a diversion. This is a messenger of the devil. This man is from the devil. He's giving a mess, knowingly or uncognizantly or incognizantly. I'm not his judge as to what his motives are. But his message is from Satan. We should be noticing these things happening. We should be looking at these events in the Middle East and so forth. God wants us to be aware of these things. He's saying, no, don't do it. So what do you think people are going to do? Will they listen to Jesus Christ or will they listen to him? Well, they'll listen to him. Six six six. In addition to which the traders and merchants bought, and all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country bought gold and silver to Solomon. And King Solomon made two hundred large shields of beaten gold, using six hundred shields of beaten gold on each large shield. And he made three hundred shields of beaten gold. using 300 shekels of gold on each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. 300 shields using 300 shekels. 
Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold, and there were six steps to the throne and a footstool in gold attached to the throne and arms on each side of the seat and two lions standing next to the arms. Twelve lions were on the six steps on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it made for any other kingdom. There's nothing like it. Six lions, six steps, six lions. Nothing like it. Silver was considered valuable. Silver was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. <laughs> you have to understand what that means. Silver in the Bible is a corrosive metal. Mo gold is a non-corrosive metal. Gold in biblical typology speaks of things of eternal value because it's non-corrosive. Store up treasures when neither moth nor rust consume. Silver will oxidize. It will rust. Silver is a precious metal of temporary value. In the Bible, it is the price of salvation. The half shekel for the firstborn, Jesus was betrayed for silver, the redemption with the silver in Leviticus and so forth. Silver speaks of the price of redemption. It's a temporary value. In other words, while we will always be eternally grateful for our salvation, we were not created to be saved. <laughs> We were created to be God's children. A time will come when the work of the cross will be complete. But in the days of Solomon, silver meant nothing. When Antichrist comes, salvation will not be an issue in any biblical sense of the word. People will be chasing the gold. You understand? Backslid and Solomon is a major type of the Antichrist. And the types of the Antichrist that are most difficult are the ones who in some contexts typify Christ and in other contexts typify the Antichrist. In the Song of Solomon, he's a shadow of Jesus. Here, he's a shadow of the one who's coming. Nebuchadnezzar is another example, remember? Some context typifies the Lord, other context the Antichrist. And again, you've got 666 with the dimensions of his image. The Antichrist knows how to look like Christ. People don't have a clue. So, so far, just in this passage, you've got the number of the beast twice. Once overtly and once covertly. Look at verse 21. For the king had ships which went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Again, we have the geographical problem. Hiram was the king of Lebanon. You could get to Spain from Lebanon. The Phoenicians were coastal sailors, but Malkisheva, queen of Sheba, was from East Africa. Big question. Nonetheless, you have the ships of Tarshish clearly and directly associated with 666. Not once, twice. Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 10. Now when the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. Same kind of thing. Same story, more or less. In fact, it's almost identical. Some of the verses are almost word for word, or are word for word. But in verse 14, Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666. 
Whenever you see that number, it should jump off the page. In addition to that from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 shields of beaten gold using 600 shields, shekels of gold in each. He made 300 shields of beaten gold using three meters of gold on each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold, and there were six steps to the throne. And around top to the throne, on back of it, and arms on each side of the seat, and two lions standing next to the arms. Now notice something. The celestial throne of the Lord in Revelation draws on the literary background of Esther chapter 1. In God's throne, it is seven, that's the number. It's always sevens. Seven this, seven that. In Solomon's, it's six. God's throne, seven. Antichrist, six. Six comes before seven. Let's look. By the way, don't study this. Rick Warren said you shouldn't be listening to this stuff. It's a diversion. Twelve lions were on the six steps, one on one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. And all Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. None was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea the ships of Tarshish. With the ships of Hiram, once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in his riches and in his wisdom. The Antichrist is going to be one unique character. And all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. I have warned and warned and warned if people cannot see through Kenny and Benny, what will happen when this guy comes? If you cannot see through a David Shearman, what's going to happen when a real deceiver comes? If you can't see through the obvious, what's going to happen when this guy comes? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Remember? Son of Perdition? Even the apostles didn't know until Jesus revealed him. If you can't see the obvious, what's going to happen when it's not so obvious, except to those who know? And our task is to make sure that you will be among those who are in the know. Let's continue. So Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. So once again, the ships of Tarshish become centrally identified with the number of the beast. We're talking about some very serious things here. Isaiah, well, oh well, oh ships of Tarshish. When Jonah tries to get on this ship, God sinks it. I'm convinced the only thing that stops people like me and you from backsliding is God's hand. 
he providentially intervenes. He might bring a minor or sometimes even a major calamity into our lives to prevent us from making it into a whole, whole total disaster. But you see, God had a calling on Jonah's life. That same God has a calling on my life. That same God has a calling on your life. And though we may try to get away from his will, you can get on the ship. But I hope you're a real good swimmer. I've seen Christians go into career directions. God didn't ordain for them because they didn't want what he wanted for them. See, people go into ministries that were not ordained of God for them. For others, yes. But it was not what he wanted for them. But it was what they wanted for them. Now remember, Jonah had good, we have the Jonah tape. Jonah had good reason for not liking the Ninevites. <laughs> Sometimes we have very plausible arguments that we lay before the Lord for not doing what he wants us to do. But ultimately, his wisdom is greater than ours. So I repeatedly see this thing of the ships of Tarshish. Isaiah, wail, oh, wail, those ships of Tarshish. Jonah, the thing sinks. Psalm 48, God will destroy it. Kings, 666. Chronicles, 666. The number of the beast, it's something about the Antichrist. Yet a good man, not a bad man, a good man, a good leader, Jehoshaphat. Like all good men, his vulnerabilities and his weaknesses, he builds the ships of Tarshish. He aligns himself with the son of Jezebel. He looks back to the good old days. He wants to see things restored. He wants the blessing. He wants to bless the people. All of that. And God wants him. But he just doesn't get it. He would draw the line. He wouldn't go along with the Brian McLaren saying it's okay, we shouldn't deal with this homosexual issue. I don't know if it's right or wrong. He wouldn't say that. He said it's wrong. He dealt with the sodomite issue. He's not like evangelicals, so called, who will remain in the Church of England or the Reformed Church that, that ordained these people. He's not like that. He's a man of courage and integrity. He wouldn't be part of something like that. And he'd only let the unity go so far. Yes, I'll build the ships with you, but you can't get in mine. Well, we'll have Alpha courses, but we won't have the Holy Spirit weekend away. No, no, you can't, you can't get in the ship. You, 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 you can't have, you, you know, you, 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 I'm sorry, but that, 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 that won't work. We're not going to have any of these lunatic preachers in our pulpit. He goes so far. But to God, it doesn't make a difference. Just because you're not worshiping Molech on the high place, you're still worshiping on the high place. Just because you will not let the sons of Jezebel get into your boat, you're still sailing in the same fleet. Why are you doing that? How can any saved Christian remain in a denomination that ordains lesbians and homosexuals? Well, our vicar doesn't agree with it. Then why is your vicar taking your money, which you give to God, paying into a diocesan fund and picking up the salary for the homosexual rector, victor in the next parish if you don't agree with it while you're picking up the bill for it? How could any pastor who loves the Lord 
keep his church in the Elam denomination. How? How can you be part of the Assemblies of God anymore? How? Well, we don't go along with everything. He did the Jehoshaphat. But the ship still sank. Our pastor loves the Lord. That's why the ship sank. So did Jehoshaphat. You see, the ship never arrives in Tarshish, does it? Just be honest. Look at the good people who went along with Alpha. Did any revival come from Alpha? Did they get their mega growth from it? Did it deliver the goods? No, it did not. Look at the people who did the prayer of Jabez. Did it deliver the goods? Did they get what they promised? Did they have the big revival? In the no, it did not. The ship doesn't reach Tarshish. The God Chasers, that guy Bruce Wilkins left Africa after writing that book, selling God knows how many copies and says he was wrong. It doesn't work. The ship does not reach Tarshish. They can go along with what they want. Gimmick to gimmick, fad to fad, it doesn't matter. The Toronto, it doesn't matter what, the ship never reaches Tarshish. The most they can hope for, the most an honest man of God can hope for, is that the ship is going to sink. Once you make an alliance with the son of Jezebel, once you fool around with her sons, once you stay in these backslidden denominations that are doing things that are morally abominable, the most you can hope for is that the ship will sink. There is, however, something worse that can happen. What can be worse than the ship sinking before it reaches Tarshish? The only thing that can actually be worse than the ship sinking before it reaches Tarshish is the ship arriving. Six, six, six. That is where it is bound for. Now it's purpose driven. That'll be the next thing. The door into the emergent church. God knows what'll be after that. But I promise you this, any honest churchman, any honest pastor, any honest man of God who makes an alliance with the sons of Jezebel, who builds ships and sails on that fleet, the ships will not arrive. The ships will sink. Hopefully. God forbid the ship should ever arrive. Let's have a break.